Okay. Hello, everyone. Time is now sharply two o'clock in Finland, so let's let's begin. So, welcome to this joint webinar with Fluidit and the Helsinki Region Environmental Services Authority, or HSY, here in Finland. Um, the webinar will last about 45 to 50 minutes, plus we have time for Q&A in the end. So please feel free anytime during this webinar to submit your questions onto the Q&A chat, and we'll get onto those towards the end of the end of the session. Okay, let's go. Um, so, hi, my name is Hannes Pyrinen. I'm from Fluidit here in Finland, and I will be your host today um, at Fluidit. I work as a lead engineer for our stormwater flood modeling and combined sewer modeling software and projects. And today we are going to learn from an industry leading sewer modeling project in Helsinki. So I have pleasure to have Lena Sankiaho here with me. Uh, she works as development engineer at HSY, and we have been working together for about three years. So yeah. welcome, Lena. How are you? Yeah, I'm fine, thanks. Yeah, it's nice to be here and and present some of the results that we've achieved in the in the recent years. So nice to be here. Thank you. So I know I know that you have a long history with all of this. So just to start with, could you briefly just outline for the audience what do you do as a development engineer at HSY? Okay. Um, basically, I'm responsible for the sewer network capacity management. Um, usually, if we have some problems with the capacity, it means that we have we get overflows or flooding in the system. So, so my job is to prevent these to happen, and uh, um, we need to be aware of the how the system works. And for that, for instance, modeling is a great tool to get an overview of the system, how it works. So, so um, on top of many of my other jobs, uh, I've been developing our modeling systems for the last five years. OK, so, well, you, you know the sewer system better than many of us. So I'd like to hand over to you and if you could tell us a bit more of the history and the background of this project. Okay. Over to you, Lena. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, um, so I think our main objective uh, in our in our modeling projects has been that we would like to be able to model the entire sewer system that we have. And uh, of course, the question is, is it, is it possible? And uh, we've been trying that now for, for a couple of years. Um, so HSY is the Helsinki Region Environmental Services Authority. Uh, we have about 1 million customers around Helsinki and um, then we got about two, we have two treatment plants or at, actually at the moment we are operating three plants, but we are just built a new one. So, so everything should be or should have, we should have two treatment plants by the end of this year. Um, we have about 3000 kilometers of sewer networks and about 2600 uh, kilometers of uh, stormwater network and also 220 kilometers of combined sewers and in that about 50 over, uh, overflow manholes. Uh, uh, during the last three years we've had about 84,000 cubic meters of overflows in average and 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 of those about 13 percent has been sewage and the rest is uh, rainwater and infiltration. So uh, a good question is why do we have a model and why to have why to model? Um, one of the main reasons is that we are reporting our combined sewer overflows uh, based on modeling, and we have been doing that in three months since was, and. Uh, in the combined series, we don't have any measurements, so so all this estimation has been done by modeling. And of course, models are really good when you want to get an overview how the system performs and uh, what's happening in the system. So, for instance, capacity issues or 
or maybe avoiding blockages uh, models are really good to see what's going on. Um, we are using models for voice investments. It's really easy to use multiple scenarios with the models. So, so it's one of the tools that we are using when, when deciding what sort of investments we are doing. And uh, at the moment, uh, in this presentation, we are covering some, some of the uh, developments we've done with the real-time simulation with the combined zero modeling. And, and uh, that's, yeah, that's what we're doing recently. And, and of course, uh, in HSY, we have a long-term goal that will be separating the whole combined series in the long run. So for that, for instance, models are really good tools to to see what what sort of steps we need to take during the during the process when we are going towards the separate serial system. So um, some points about why we are having a or why we need a real time model. Um, I think uh, unfortunately we still have the overflows in Helsinki and. Uh, I think we need to be really open with, uh, about the issue that we have these overflows and something needs to be done for this. We need some investments if we want to get rid of these overflows. So, so one of the ways is to be open that we, we have this and, and uh, this is the amount and these are happening quite frequently. So at the moment we are doing the modeling every three months. So, so there's quite a lot happening during the three months. So like it's, it's is not really proactive. It's it's more like okay, we get the results, but that doesn't help in 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 the long run. Uh, so um, so I think that for that reason, we need to have more accurate results real time, and uh, the results uh, that we've now got with the real time model, they can be distributed in different systems. We can. We can, for instance, use them for uh, or to develop an alarm system. I think in Berlin and in Copenhagen, they already had these sort of systems that that um, you can have an alarm telling that okay, there's been an overflow and maybe you should be avoiding swimming, for instance, if if, if there's been an overflow. And for instance, if we want to do some like research, how much the uh, overflows affect the water quality it's it's better to have the results real time it's it doesn't make any it, like after three months you can't really see what's been what has been going on so so you need to get the results real time so so if, if you want to get any water samples um, what we've done now we've automated some of the modeling steps in this project we've been already doing quite a lot uh, with the, previously we fluid it in the automation, but uh, but now now we are doing it now it's even faster. And uh, and with this real time modeling, we can uh, visualize the results uh, better than what we done previously. So yeah. Um, Hannes, I built, uh, want to say something in this? Yeah, I mean, thanks. That's good, good sort of summary for why we are going for the um, going for the real time modeling. Um, there's, however, been quite a lot happening before before the real time stuff we are discussing today. So, we just like to know a bit of the background or how how did you get this far? It's been a long yeah. journey already. So, just a brief summary, yeah. please. <laughs> Yeah, uh, at le well, in Helsinki, we've already started modeling in 1995, the first model. But of course, uh, like 25 years ago, the computers were quite slow and and you were only able to model maybe a small part of the system. So, so um, yeah, we started already quite a long time ago. And, and in 2012, uh, we did the last calibration for the old model. Um, but at that point, it was already quite clear that uh, maybe we should need need something new that uh, the old one wasn't really capable of doing what we wanted. And uh, and uh, so in 2015, we actually uh, initiated a major 
model update project. Um, and since that, that's, that was like seven years ago, since that we've been doing quite a lot uh, uh, to improve our systems to, to be able to model the whole, whole network. One of the things that has taken a lot of time is to review all the network data. Uh, we have the 3000 kilometers of network, so that's one of the main issues that if you want to de uh, develop the network model, you need to have good data to do that. And uh, then we decided that we're going to use uh, SWIM as the base for the model. And, uh, and, and then uh, we still haven't modeled the whole system. We've done part of it, but uh, there's still a lot of work to do. But in 2020, uh, we started to develop our new combined zero flow model with Fluidit. Um, and by the end of 2020, we were able to adopt the new model for the combined zero flow reporting. And so now we've been running it for, for two years. But uh, this year, we've also been by the side of this, uh, this uh, combined zero model, we've also been developing the real time simulation pilot. So, so yeah, that's where we are at the moment. Um, yeah. And why do we model instead of uh, measurements? Uh, I think this picture on the right indicates quite well how the system looks like in real world, not in the model. But this is actually one of the places where we get most of the overflows uh, according to the model. And uh, this place would be extremely difficult to, to set uh, any measurements in instruments. Uh, because, uh, well, this road is uh, the road towards Helsinki Harbour, so we've got a lot of heavy traffic, we've got trams, and uh, and the manhole where we have the overflow, it's, it's not designed for any measurements, it's, it's, it's quite small, and, and uh, to actually get someone to install a measurement device there and, and actually to get really good results could, have been, could be quite difficult. So, so inst instead of measurements, or measuring, we have been deciding to do this by, by modeling. Okay, thanks, Lena, for the intro. Let's have a look at the model. We talk about the model, so we have to finally show something about, about the model. Um, so I will briefly present the sort of concepts in the model. What, how does it work in a, in a sort of conceptual way? And then after this, we will move on to the real time real time project. So as Lena explained, it's a it's a rather large model, but it's still only part of the whole whole system. So currently there is roughly 17 square kilometers of combined sewer system, and then there are um, quite large separate sewer areas that connect through the con the combined sewer area, as well as the regional flows that are then taken into the um, the Ikimaki treatment plant uh, calculations. From the sort of hydrology point of view, it's a very, very interesting model. So we are using a radar rainfall. So this is the first time I think when it has been used at this scale. It hasn't gone without problems though, but at least we get better representation of spatial variability. Um, we are modeling all the rainfall runoff processes on the catchments, including snow melt. We have soil parameters estimated roughly, and uh, many of these things are coming from the land cover data that is very nice and very good data set in Helsinki. So there's an example of it on the, on the bottom, bottom of the screen. So you can separate the impervious areas, the roads, different kinds of uh, vegetated areas, and from those you can derive, derive the catchment parameters quite well. In terms of the sewer system and the components, it obviously includes the typical sewer model, like the groundwater infiltration and the base wastewater flows, and which will vary based on the user patterns, of course. Then on top of that, we get the interesting part, which is the either storm runoff or snow melt, which will cause the highest peaks in the system. And for example, the, the snow melt can um, be three times larger. I mean, the, the flows into the treatment plant can be three times larger during the springtime than they are in, no in a normal condition. 
So even the snow melt as, an, um, as a phenomena is very, very uh, important in Helsinki. Um, let me also account for pollutants because HSY needs to report the pollutant loads going into Baltic Sea. So how many kilograms are going to the Baltic Sea per, you know, three months basically, but also it's interesting to know how much overflow and how much pollutant were they, let's say last week. Um, so we can separate, we can sort of tag the water to sewage and storm water. So we can always keep them separate in the, in the simulation and then we can quantify them individually and also quantify the pollutants that they are carrying. So well, what, what do we get out of this? Um, in nutshell, we of course get to know where the overflows are occurring. We get to pinpoint them on the map. We get some key results such as uh, quantity of the discharge, so how many cubic meters, the loads, as I mentioned, in kilograms. And then also we can, anywhere in the system, we can pinpoint how much sewage there is in the water versus um, stormwater. So what it, how, how diluted the sewage is. And that also helps to understand how the network is working in a bigger picture. So what parts of the network are carrying, let's say too much stormwater, which is typically waste of energy and resources. And so you can maybe make some conclusions from that. And in terms of the results, as we're coming to the real time world, um, now there is an opportunity to get results, let's say, in a matter of minutes. Even within 30 to 60 minutes would be a really, really nice improvement over to the current three-month reporting step, as Lena very well explained. And that's one of the main, main, main reasons why we are here. But with this sort of big model, as the city scale model, um, there was a lot of data to deal with. So I want to highlight some, some key processes we had to think of. So as we have a large model with many, many time series, so let's say over 300 time series for every simulation, it would be absolutely a terrible job to do it by hand. It would take a lot of time and it would be error prone. And, you know, it would be just causing more, more trouble in the long run. So therefore, as uh, HSO wanted to automate as much as possible, we then developed together a process, a script that does take all the input data, makes it into the right formats, and imports them into the model. So basically with few clicks, you get all the background data in a nice way into the model. Already a lot of time saved. Then, then Lena could focus on the modeling tasks, or her team could do the um, assessments she wanted. And once that job is done, then there would be other, other end of the pipe where we have, again, a script that will put together the key results wanted in the right format, in the right place. Even complete fi file folder structures can be exported with complete maps and um, all kind of visual output with few clicks. So this was one of the main main uh, sort of wins that was gotten with the, with the new modeling approach. That they can save time on those sort of um, routine tasks. Some examples just briefly on, on the results that we have to tailor made for HSY. So they were like, let's say result dashboards, like you see on the, on the right, the overflow card, there's a pumping station card with some key results, um, you know, maps with the overflow locations, some summary tables and CSV files and so on. So all kinds of results. So when I ask Lena just briefly, like from your point of view, what are the most important results and how would you use them? In a, in a, a practical example, what would you normally do? Um, practically, well, because we we hand over these results to a consult, so they they will make the report for the environmental authority. So, for instance, for them, we we give the CSV files with the with the results, so they have the, all the three months uh, results in a table, and then then we have some maps or the map view of the system where where you can can see on the map that uh, how much overflow we had had in in each each location so 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 for us the csv reports and the maps have been really uh, or the summary tables have been really 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 useful but also it's it's good to have those uh those cards or dashboards uh, to see that if there are some some areas that you are, you might be more interested in to know how, how the system has been working so 
yeah, they all been really useful. OK, um, good. I think now it's time to move on to the, the, the real time project. So. Let's talk about this project called Overy and uh, what is it about? So I will hand over okay. back to Lena to explain a bit of, bit of this project. Yeah, um, OK, thanks. Yeah, uh, so we've had a project called Overy. And uh, at HSY, we have actually two projects uh, or two sub projects in this 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 uh, whole project. And one of them has been this uh, development of uh, of the model capacities towards the real time CSO simulation. And another one has been uh, a pilot, or we've been testing and piloting new methods for sewer leak detection. Uh, we've had some funding from the Finnish uh, Ministry of Environment. And, uh, and this is part of a program called Water Protection Program. Uh, we started our part in was in March, uh, April of this year, and our our goal is to finish this by the end of the year, end, end of this year. But the other other sub project is uh, still carrying on till the mid uh, uh, August next year. So what we're actually doing in this project, uh, we are collaborating with uh, Fluidit and a company called Smart Button. Uh, Smart button or Neuroflux is actually the system that we are using for visualizing, visualizing and analyze for our pumping station data. So our, our, idea, our, our idea is that we can uh, get some data from Neuroflux, or they are doing some, some uh, pre-processing for the data and that is coming into the model. And, uh, and also the results will be seen in the same system that we are actually using for for other other reasons, so so it's uh, nice to have one system where we where we can see what's going on with the pump station, but also what is going on with the with the overflows. And we have been developing this system in a test environment, so it's still not in 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 uh, implemented in the process, but uh, it's it's been a test environment. And uh, then. We've had sort of like a pilot uh, time or the third quarter of this year. Uh, we have been using, uh, or we've been doing this uh, real time simulations. And then the idea has been that we compare these results with the other, with, with the results that we get with the other other methods. So, so, well, the main goal is to get the same sort of results in both systems, but, uh, there's still be some 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 things that are have not or not exactly the same, but but uh, we are almost there. Um, and during this process, we are also uh, seeing how what is what does it require if if we are actually trying to implement this uh, this uh, to operational environment. So yeah, these have been the main goals in 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 our project. OK, so let's look at this real time. So what does it actually mean? So it's good to go to the bottom of it. Um, in this case, we could call call it a hindcast simulation at one hour interval. If that sounds trivial, that that's OK. It sounds a bit, you know, engineering. But what it means is that as we are looking back, you know, one hour in the in the history, basically. So that's as close to real time as we get at the current stage. Um, and why is one hour? Is that we rely on external data coming from uh, from pumping stations, for example. And from those pumping stations, we currently get the data in one hour sort of uh, resolution. So therefore, that's the best we can get. That's the limiting factor, really, in in this current st status of the project. Um, there are some other data sources, obviously, that we get much better response already, like the precipitation we can have at five minute intervals. The actual simulation of the, the whole model takes roughly two minutes. Um, and the data processing before and after the simulation is also uh, very quick. It's a matter of minutes. So from the main point, uh, I'd like to think that there's a lot of potential to increase even the frequency of simulations. 
if some those, those limiting limiting data sources can be improved in the longer term. But even now, as I said earlier, one hour delay is already a fantastic result compared to that three month delay. So one hour is good good benchmark for now. So if you look at this image on the right side of the screen, we just uh, like to highlight how what it means really that the near real time is just looking at the past one hour. Uh, where we like to go, of course, is the, the forecasting, which will be looking forward in the time, because only then we could finally start setting these sort of thresholds to give, let's say, overflow alerts or other warnings. So that's even much more interesting. The, for the forecasting would be much more interesting and beneficial. But currently we are very happy with the near real time approach. From the operator's perspective, just a simple schematic here, what it means basically that the system would start, let's say 10 o'clock, like in the figure over here. There would be some delay as we take the data. We want to make sure that all data sources can be can, can be read correctly. So we rather give some excess time for the data to transfer to the um, server where the model runs. Then finally, when we are certain that all the data is there, then we can uh, simulate the model. And that, as I said, it would take you know, a couple of minutes or thereabout. Once the simulation is done, then there would be other little delay to process the results and then hand them back over to the Neuroflux system where HSY operators would be looking at the results. But all up, it would be minimum like 15 minutes or something. That is the practical delay. So it's very, very quick considering all the post-processing and pre-processing needed. So that's and then if we were ready, if the data was coming more quickly from the pumping station, we could already start the next simulations at let's say 10, 15, and then 10, 30, then 45, and so on. But currently we are going at one hour interval. But this is roughly the, the loop that goes goes around and around. In terms of the loop, I like to have a simple process here. Um, so what happens every time when the when the model starts to simulate? There are a few clear phases. So obviously, first we obtain the input data. What that includes is that we connect to those external sources. For example, the um, Finnish Meteorological Institute (FMI). We get some data from them, like temperature and sea level. Then we have the Neuroflux system where we are getting some pumping station data. And also we, in this case, we get the precipitation through through the um, system. That data is imported into the model. And then obviously in the model, all kinds of processes will be done and they are controlled by the Python scripts that just put together the operations that we need to do. It's just a way to put together those uh, phases. And one important thing to note here is that all this Python um, runs within Fluid Storm software itself. So HS1 doesn't need to install other Python you know, software on the computer. So that's a positive thing for the IT security point of view. So it all happens in the in the Fluid Storm software. The pre-processing of inputs, then we do the actual simulation, and then of course post-processing of results, which then would export to the Neuroflux system that they use for visualizing or looking at the, the uh, summary results. Well, then from the system point of view, there is this scheduler that would define, OK, now it's time to start the next simulation round. It will initiate a batch file that will again say the rest of the package that, OK, let's go, let's do it again. And then it will loop around and around. So this is in simple terms, this is how the real time system works. And this sits on the uh, on the HSY server. It's uh, there in a good secure place uh, where they can use it. And um, there's not not like a, in a web server or anything like that. It's in a physical server where, where it sits. OK, so. Just to paint you a bit bigger picture. Um, so now that as the hindcast pilot is coming to an end, uh, we are currently comparing the, the results 
just to validate validate it with the the previous simulation methods like a three month interval uh, so we'll continue that early early next year to so just get more certainty on the performance and then sometime next year hopefully well, we would be ready to implement the real-time modeling platform but that's still only the beginning of what could be done so i want to Paint you this journey that could be followed. So there could be, for example, forecast model coming next. Um, that would, however, require some rather innovating thinking with the rainfall data. So with raster, red, uh, let's say radar rainfall, you know, so it would be a lot of data to deal with, and there's not yet like a best practice method how how to really deal with the data. So that's something that can be researched. But once that is sorted, then a forecast model would be a natural step forward. Um, there could be other applications like 2D flood simulations. If we want to go more on the urban flooding warning type model and system, and there, you know, the early warning system could be warning about the overflows, of course, but it could be warning about the the surface flooding as well. So then, sort of just opening the doors for further development. As now we are got the um, the model has the linkages to external sources and also we well HSY has set up the IT infrastructure to facilitate these sort of developments okay but let's look at the project so I know that there has been some challenges during the project and some things that we have to really focus on so I'd like to hand over to Lena just to mention some of them and what have been the main sort of points to really focus on during this process. Uh, yeah, thanks, Hannes. Um, yeah, uh, data management uh, is being highlighted here. It's uh, one of the things that when there's three different parties uh, developing, developing this proce process, uh, we need to know that the units are right in every system, that uh, they are not meters, they are millimeters, or the rainfall is in millimeters, not in meters, and the, Sea level is at the right right level, not in millimeters, in, rather in meters. And uh, and if we get an output, we know that the system that we are using it is 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 having the same sort of units. So so there's been a lot of that sort of data management and uh, and uh, and we yeah, learned a lot during the process. Um, we had this three months uh, period for for piloting, and it means means that we needed to uh, review the results all the time because we realized that okay there might be some issues with the with the input data that uh, the results didn't look really right. So 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 it, it was really good to have that uh, three month period uh, for piloting. We've also had four uh, level meters in the system. We have some overflow places that we could use me measurements, but uh, but they are not actually working. So well, they they are not overflows and low overflowing so often that uh, that uh, we wouldn't need maybe the measurements there all the time. But uh, but now we've had the level meters in these four places, so we can validate the results with 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 the meters. Um, and there's still quite a lot that needs to be discussed when, when, or if we want to have this real-time simulation implemented in, into, into action, <laughs> or what's the right word? But because uh, we need to know the process and requirements for the for the system, how does it, how does it need to work? Uh, what if there's some gaps in the data? What if we don't get any input data, or maybe the what if uh, the the server crashes or there's some something going on in the system? So, so that's one of the things that, um, or many of the things that we've been discussing during this process. And of course, cybersecurity has been uh, an issue. Well, it hasn't been an issue during this project, but it's something that has been uh, taken into account during this project. Okay, thanks, Lena. So from this, uh, I'd like to sort of go 
bit further into some other interesting things, because I know that you have been working on many interesting projects at HSY. So are there some other highlights you'd like to like to mention, like which been which, which link to this project really? Yeah. Well, there are a few examples. Uh, for instance, uh, this year uh, we've had a master thesis uh, working working for us, uh, Moen as uh, Ashokte uh, from Tampere University. He has been uh, developing an automated catchment definition for the simulation of a city scale network. So there's been a lot of work with the catchment updates. Uh, in this work, uh, four different methods have been tested um, and, uh, and they have been tested in four case areas where we we'd actually had some um, calibration measurements previously. So, so we can compare the results with the, with the measurements. And in this, uh, this uh, project, uh, Moen has been analyzing the uh, uh, results hydrographs and, and their accuracy with the with the measured measured uh, flows and uh, and one of the main main uh, concerns for us has been the speed of the process. How quickly can you can you make uh, the catchments? Because because uh, uh, of course we. For us, uh, well, it's important to know that okay, if if we if we build new catchments, how long does it take to do that? And uh, and then how to implement this uh, this catchment delineation to the the whole city scale model? So um, so the that was the first step, and the second step is now now the information implementation for the city scale model and uh, for that we have chosen Skalgo as a, as the tool. Yeah and then okay. another project um, oh actually um, in this picture on the right uh, you can see in the green area is actually the combined sewer area where we have uh, that covers the the combined area but we also have finished our other model for the Suomenoja treatment plant catchment. And that, well, that is even larger than the, than the compound sewer area. And, uh, and, and, and uh, it's been used for, for instance, for investment planning. So, so we made some future, future scenarios with the model and, uh, and it will be, we have some data for for infiltration and inflow use for the for the model so so uh, that catchment has been covered but we still have uh, maybe one third of the area on un unmodeled or we don't have a model for the for the red area in the picture so uh, now being we've done two two models with uh, with uh, maybe a little bit different methods and and we le learned a lot and uh, now we would be ready maybe to do the to the rest of the the catchments or the vegan mega catchment okay very good um one other thing i i like to sort of highlight from from the combined sewer area that there is an opportunity to also analyze the, the overflows bit let's say in a new new way um, so with the, with the combined sewer model that HSY uh, runs and then what they what they operate, they can already up, apply flood simulations on top of it. So in this example, I'm just um, showing how it could work having the 1D model already done that you would only really go another little step forward and you already get flood results. So in this case, I'm gonna to highlight this animation for where the network is analyzed, of course, and then with the overflows, you would start getting overflow onto the surface. So if we stop stop here and you think that typically you'd have a network model with red dots on the map and you see, OK, oh, no, we got 20 red dots all over the place and there, there is some overflow, but you have, would have no very practical idea where the overflow is actually going. Is it causing some type of you know hazard? How long is the overflow going to be, let's say, ponding on certain areas and so on? 
So obviously the surface flow analysis would give you much, much more information on top of your typical, a typical network modeling. Um, and if you combine it with, you know, this kind of schematics you can create, you can then analyze the network quite nicely with the long sections and graphs and maps and get just a nice bit of extra piece of information from, from, from the model. And I think that might be a future one day that the overflows are actually modeled this way as well. Currently they are not yet, but it's just an opportunity I like to uh, note to the audience that it can be done already. It's just a matter of choosing a path to do it. Um, from this, we start going towards the um, sort of key learnings from the project and start to wrap up this quite big package package of information. Um, so I'd like to ask Lena some of the main learnings or sort of the best best learnings from this project is it's sort of the whole model, but more so on the real time aspect of it. So what what have we learned? What are the best things so far? Um, well, it has been quite it is well it, it, ah, moving to this real time model. It's it's been quite it's it's been small effort compared to all, all the other development parts that we have done during the seven years. So it, it actually it's like everything has happened quite smoothly in in, in the past half year, and uh, and it's it's been. Uh, it's been um, oh we made it already working. It's 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 been quite quite easy to move into this real real time model, and uh, it's really good that we now can also have these results in 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 different systems that we have the system that we are using anyway for 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 checking uh, how 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 pumping stations are working. So so to have the results in the same place. Uh, it's, uh, it's of course it's it's uh, better for wider audience so uh, more more operational people in in HSY can see the results right the way and uh, of course it's uh, it's also increased the uh, temp temporal resolution of the results and accuracy and and it's it in the future it will help uh, automate the system so uh, it will help my 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 workload a lot when when there's not uh, like as, well the old system takes about uh, two to three days to run and 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 to see the results and check the results so so with this with this uh, real time uh, simulation it's it's uh, it's basically out totally automated so of course it's 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 nice nice to have that sort of system. Yeah, good. that's good. Good point. And I probably should should mention to the audience that uh, why why the temporal resolution is actually changing because of this this real time yeah. project. Can mm -hmm. would you articulate that somehow? Um, that's a good question. Uh, well, now when we like previously we've been uh, modeling the system in three months. Uh, period and and for instance uh we'd had some difficulties that when the model has had some issues with with the with the with the calculation it's uh, sort of copying this errors to the next or, or for each each time step and now when we are doing it in smaller steps uh, we can actually have the model running more smoothly in a way that is not making the same similar errors that is um multiplying into the next um, simulation time step what is the, it's doing in 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 the old uh, or the three months um, modeling that's yeah. maybe quite yeah. difficult to explain but but uh, yeah that, that's good um, I think one one quite practical example would be that you know when you do a three three month modeling you would have to store a big chunk of data and results, you, yeah. you would have a massive data set of results. Yeah. Um, and you want to limit that to an extent. So then that's why what we have had to do that we use like, let's say 10 minute, that sort of time step for the results. So some quite coarse resolution. 
But yeah. now, with, as we only simulate the past one hour, we would then have a possibility to use higher resolution modeling. So with a short time step, because the result file won't be that large because mm -hmm. it's a short time frame. So yeah. that, that's one practical thing why we can now achieve a, a high resolution model. Yeah, yeah. The, the old ones have been quite heavy. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so I'm interested to hear like where are we going from here? Um, what are the ambitions? at HSY as an organization, where where are we going, let's say, in the next next little while? Um, well, one of the things is uh, that we are still lacking one third of the, the area is not modeled. So, so that would be a great thing to do next, to have the whole area modeled. Um, of course, with the with the catchments, uh, we need to see how how they are working the new ones and uh and next year we are uh, again doing we we do every four years we do quite large uh development project uh, for the sewer system or we we see that what sort of investments we need to do in in the next 20 years so for that of course the models will be used and um and and uh one of the things that we are planning to do in, in Helsinki is the separation of the combined sewers. And, and for that, we have been using the model and we'll be using the model. And uh, yeah, those are the few few things that we still need to work with. Yeah. OK. Um, all right. Let's. We have time for, for questions from the audience. So if, if you haven't yet sent any questions to the Q and A. You can still do it. Um, you can, of course, we will we will share our contact details very soon, so you can also contact us afterwards. But one thing I've I've been wondering many times, and also it's been asked by other utilities from from me when I talk about these models that they sort of ask, what, what do they need to have in order to even start thinking about city scale models? So could you could you give some tips on the must have Sort of capability or information that they they should have if they want to do something similar. Um, well, of course, the the network information system uh, should be in in quite good order before you need to, before you can start. So you need to work with the data in the network system network information system before before you can do these sort of things. For us, it took. Uh, at the moment, at the beginning of the project, it, it took quite a long time to go through the data and see what is missing and uh, how we can improve it. For well, that, you can do part of that uh, automated or, or semi-automatically. You can you can check that if you have, for instance, uh, you know the pipe diameters close to the ones that are missing. So for those, you can also or, or use some automation, but yeah, yeah, the missing data in the in the network system. That's that's one of the things that is taking quite a long time to improve. Thanks. That's a very very important point, and um, people often also ask that you know how how this can be done. Like um, from our point, we said that you know it's best, of course, if the organization really wants to develop their data at the same time. You know that they take put the effort into reviewing the network information, filling the gaps and so on. They can, of course, they, they could contact consultants to do, do the job, but I find it much more fruitful if the, if the utility itself does it, like, like you have done at HSY. You, yeah. you can also learn, learn these processes and you know your system so well after yeah. that process. But you can also use the modeling tools to check the data, which which, which you can do with fluids. You can you can see where where there's data missing, or if there's some 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 odd data do, between the pipes. If you have some small pipes between larger ones, or if you have some funny funny slopes in the system and that sort of thing. So so we also used uh, fluid for for improving the data. But but with the large amount of data, it's maybe better to use some some for instance, we've been using FME to, to improve the data quality. 
Okay, very good. Thanks. Um, I think we start wrapping up. There's not yet many questions, so I'm sure there will be so many by email afterwards. Um, so it's time to thank you, Lena. Thanks for your insights today. Thanks to the for the audience. Um, thanks for listening and also listening this afterwards in YouTube. You can um, you know check us out. You can send us questions even in the long run. And um, at this point, I just hope you have a great afternoon and let's stay in touch. And thanks again, Lena. Yeah. See you later. Yes. Thank you.